the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. Practical Psychology for Today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, voiced by David Alt. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. In this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from The Sufis by Idris Shah. This audio has been made available by the Idris Shah Foundation. The Creed of Love One went to the door of the Beloved and knocked. A voice asked, Who is there? He answered, It is I. The voice said, There is no room for me and thee. The door was shut. After a year of solitude and deprivation, he returned and knocked. A voice from within asked, Who is there? The man said, It is thee. The door was opened for him. Jalaluddin Rumi Sufism has often been called the creed of love. All Sufis, irrespective of the external appearance of their schools, has made this theme a matter of essential concern. The analogy of human love as a reflection of real truth, so often expressed in Sufi poetry, has often been literally interpreted by others than Sufis. When Rumi says, Wherever you are, whatever your condition is, always try to be a lover, he is not speaking of love as an end in itself, nor of human love as the ultimate possibility in the potential of the human being. The deterioration of the Sufic love ideal in the West is seen to develop fairly after the loss of a linguistic grasp of the word groupings adopted by Sufi teachers to convey the fact that their idea of love was much more than idyllic fantasy. Spreading from Spain and southern France into Western Europe, undergoing a change of language which robbed it of its effective content, the creed of love lost many of its essential characteristics. In order to recapture, for a Western audience, the comprehensive nature of this Sufic specialization, we have to look at the development of the troubadours. One aspect of love poetry arising in Saracen Spain that of the elevation of womankind, was rapidly diverted by the church, as has been noted by historians, into the idealization of the Virgin Mary. This development is seen in the collection of poetry made by Alfonso the Sage from Saracen sources. An authority on this subject freezes this moment for us in referring to these Cantigas de Santa Maria, The subject, the praise of the Virgin Mary, is a logical development of the troubadours' idealization of the Lady of the Manor, while the poems of the troubadours are, in matter, form, and style, closely connected with Arabic idealism and Arabic poetry written in Spain. J. B. Trend, The Legacy of Islam, Oxford, 1931, page 31. Professor Hitti and others are fully persuaded of the Arab origins of the troubadours. The troubadours resembled Arab singers not only in sentiment and character, but also in the very forms of their minstrelsy. Certain titles which these Provençal singers gave to their songs are but translations from Arabic titles. P. Hitti, History of the Arabs, New York, 1951, page 600. The derivation of the word troubadour from the Romance word for finding is a secondary one. They were finders in the sense that this was the nearest applicable naturalization of the original term, which is an Arabic word, itself a play between two words. The first is RBB, vial, used by Sufi minstrels, and applied by both Kayam and Rumi to themselves as Professor Nicholson has pointed out. 
R. A. Nicholson, Selections from the Divani Shamsi Tabriz, pages 36 and following. The second is the root TRB. There is a third associated sound, RB, which literally means, when transformed into Rabat, lady, mistress, female idol. As shown again and again in this book, Sufi names for specialist groups were invariably chosen with the greatest possible care and regard for the poetic niceties of the situation. We should remember that the adur part of the word is merely the Spanish agental suffix and is no part of the original concept. Following up the dictionary definitions of the RB and TRB roots, if used to describe the activities of a group of people, we find ten main derivative words. 1. Tarabab, to perfume, rear a child. 2. Raba, to collect, rule people, have authority over. 3. Tarabab, to claim mastership. 4. Rab, the Lord, God, Master. 5. Rabat, Lady, Mistress, Female Idol. 6. Ribab, Covenant, Friends, Tithes. 7. Marab, Gatherer, Abode, Meeting Place. 8. Marabab, Preserve, Confection. 9. Mutrib, musician, Sufi exponent, teacher, guide. Professor Edward Palmer, Oriental Mysticism, page 80. 10. Rabab, viol, adjective for Sufi singer used by Rumi, Kayam, etc. Seen in the light of Sufic usage, therefore, we are not dealing with a phenomenon of Arab minstrelsy but with the efforts of a group of Sufi teachers, in which the love theme was a part of the whole. The idealization of woman or the playing of the viol are insignificant, but nonetheless partial aspects of the whole. The teachings of Sufi schools contain all the elements collected in the special name of troubadour. Sufis gather together at a meeting place. Some live in convents. Rabat, still commemorated in such Spanish place names as the Arabida, Rabida, Rapita, Rabeda of today. They call themselves and are called lovers and also masters. Although masters, they are also, as they frequently emphasize, slaves of love. They play the viol and use a certain password containing the two alliterative words for confection and beloved to emphasize or commemorate that the name of the group has several distinct yet allied meanings. The phrase could roughly be translated as be a darling, RB, and pass the jam, RB. They speak of divinity as female, idol, mistress. Ibn al-Arabi, the greatest master of the Sufis, the Spaniard, used this imagery to such a degree that he was accused of blasphemy. The troubadours are a derivation from a Sufic movement originally grouped around their name, which stuck to them after its many facets were forgotten. The Arabs ruled Spain from the early part of the 8th century, and flourishing Sufi schools are noted during the 9th century. The first Provençal poets wrote at the end of the 11th century. The correspondence between troubadour feeling, however diluted a form of the Sufi stream it became, and original Sufi material was noted even by people who had no specialist knowledge of the interior contact. Emerson equates the great Sufi love poet Hafiz and the troubadours, and claims them for the true essence of poetry. Read Hafiz and the Trouvere, fact books which all geniuses prize as raw material and as an antidote to verbiage and false poetry.
That there was something deeper than the superficial appearance about the troubadours was noted by Robert Graves in The White Goddess. Writing at a time when he had not investigated Sufism to any extent, he realised that there had been a process at work in the poetry which had altered its original sense and direction. Fancy played a negligible part in the development of the Greek, Latin and Palestinian myths, or of the Celtic myths, until the Norman-French Trouvère worked them up into irresponsible romances of chivalry. They are all grave records of ancient religious customs or events, and reliable enough as history once their language is understood, and allowance has been made for errors in transcription, misunderstandings, or obsolete ritual, and deliberate changes introduced for moral or political reasons. Faber and Faber edition, London, 1961, page 13. In order to orientate ourselves, to taste the atmosphere of those days when Sufi thinking through poetry and music was providing a leaven to Western thought which is still with us, we can turn to Michelet, the French medievalist. Jules Michelet, Satanism and Witchcraft, translated A. R. Allinson, London, 1960, pages 71 to 73. The darkness of scholastic Christianity is being replaced by the light and warmth of Saracen life, in spite of the eclipse of its military power, he says. The picture which he draws for us shows very clearly the effect of Sufi, not Arab, thinking. This passage might almost have been designed for the purpose. Its very existence underlines Michelet's intuitive sense of an underlying process, just as much as Emerson and Graves, the poets, feel the Sufi impulse in Hafiz and the Troubadours. He tells us, for instance, that Dante and St. Thomas Aquinas look upon Satan in one of two ways. The Christian way, grotesque and coarse-minded, such as he was in his earliest days, when Jesus could still drive him to enter into a herd of swine. And the other, the Sufi way, as a subtle reasoner, a scholastic theologian, a phrase-mongering jurist. This latter view is again and again insisted upon by the Sufis. Seek the real Satan in the scholastic sophist, or the hair-splitting doctor for he is the opposite of truth. The second trend emphasised by Michelet as a legacy of Islam to the West, a new realisation of love, maternity, art, colour, verve, is strongly marked in the ideas and activities of the Sufis, not the austere scholastics of Muslim Spain who, in 1106-43, burned publicly the books of Ghazali, one of the greatest Sufis. From Asia, that men thought they had abolished, rises a new dawn of incomparable splendour, whose rays strike far, very far, until they pierce the heavy mists of the West. Here is a world of nature and art that brute ignorance had called accursed, but which now starts forth to conquer its conquerors in a peaceful war of love and maternal charm. All men yield to its spell, all are fascinated, and will have nothing that is not from Asia. The Orient showers her wealth upon us, the webs and the shawls and carpets of exquisite softness and cunningly blended colours of her looms. The keen, flashing steel of her damascened blades convince us of our own barbarism. Is there one being of sanity strong enough? whose sanity is so rare, to receive all this without giddiness, without intoxication? Is there a brain that, not being petrified, crystallised in the barren dogmas of Aquinas, is still free to receive life and the vigorous sap of life? Three wizards essay the task. Albertus Magnus, Roger Bacon, Arnaldus de Villanova and by innate vigour of mind they force their way to nature's source. But bold and intrepid as their genius is, it has not, it cannot have, 
the adaptability, the power of the popular spirit. The Sufi stream was partially dammed. The West accepted the bases of much luxury, love poetry and the enjoyment of living. Certain elements, necessary to the whole and impossible without a human exemplar of the Sufi way, remained almost unknown. The Sufi guide, in his distorted form of a mysterious near-occultist figure, lingered on in strange places. He was, for the most part, someone heard about, not met. Centuries later, reaching back toward the sources of the love cult which had shaped his own Western heritage, no less a personage than Professor Nicholson, the great scholar, himself composed a Sufic verse. Love, love alone can kill what seemed dead, the frozen snake of passion. Love alone, by tearful prayers and fiery longing fed, reveals a knowledge schools have never known. R. A. Nicholson, Rumi, Poet and Mystic, London, 1956 Such was the vitality of the inner Sufic theme of this poetry that it laid the foundation of a great deal of subsequent Western literature. As one writer puts it, Without the Provençal and Troubadour singers, there would be precious little in our contemporary music worth the name. True, we could have had dirges and folk songs, but the strange insistent call to something else, something which awaits us, something which as human beings we have to accomplish, would probably be missing from poetry and music alike. G. Butler, The Leadership of the Strange Cult of Love Bristol, 1910, page 17. Sufi transmission, in however attenuated a form, must be considered to be a basic ingredient of modern life. This is not to say that its goals are understood today, because the tradition as known in the West is necessarily incomplete. The greatest authority upon the Arabs, Professor Philip Hitty, regards this Provençal and Troubadour transmission as marking a new civilization for the West. In southern France, the first Provençal poets appear full-fledged towards the end of the 11th century, with palpitating love expressed in a wealth of fantastic imagery. The Troubadours, Tarab, music, song, who flourished in the 12th century, imitated their southern contemporaries, the Zajal singers. Following the Arabic precedent, the cult of the dame suddenly arises in southwest Europe. The Chanson de Roland, the noblest monument of early European literature, whose appearance prior to 1080 marks the beginning of a new civilization, that of Western Europe, just as the Homeric poems mark the beginning of historic Greece, owes its existence to a military contact with Muslim Spain. P.K. Hitti, History of the Arabs, 1951 edition, page 562. European music as we know it today was transformed by this development from Sufi sources. Adelard of Bath, who studied music at Paris, was probably the translator of al Khwarizmi's mathematical treatise Liber Isagogarum al Khorizm. He was, therefore, one of the first to introduce Arab music into the Latin world. It is significant that in this same period, a new principle appears in Christian European music, the principle that notes have an exact time value or ratio among themselves. The term ocatus, rhythmic mode, is probably a transformation of Arabic ikat, plural of ika. Mensual music was probably the greatest, but certainly not the only contribution the Arabs made in this branch of knowledge. P.K. Hitti, History of the Arabs, 1951 edition. The association between love and poetry, between the poet and the musician, and between these and the magician in the widest sense, runs through Sufism as through the Western tradition which it undoubtedly contacted and reinforced. 
It is as if the twin streams of the ancient teaching mingle on this dimension, far removed from the coldly rationalizing intellect. The object of the poet-lover-magician is not, however, in Sufism, merely to be absorbed in the effulgence of the truth which he learns. He is transformed by it, and as a consequence has a social function, to inject back into the stream of life the direction which humanity needs in order to fulfill itself. This is the role of the secret garden, experience beyond which comes the understanding of the poet's mission. Florence Lederer grasps this sense strongly when commenting upon Shabistari's wonderful poem, The Secret Garden. But the man must not rest in this divine union. He must return to this world of unreality, and in the downward journey must keep the ordinary laws and creeds of man. F. Lederer, The Secret Garden, London, 1920 Anwari, like the Western magician poets of old, emphasizes that the poet and lover shade into one another. If to be a lover is to be a poet, I am a poet. If to be a poet is to be a magician, I am a magician. If to be a magician is to be thought evil, I can be thought evil. If to be thought evil is to be disliked by worldlings, I am content to be such. Disliked by worldlings is to be a lover of the true reality more often than not. I affirm that I am a lover. A Sufi poet of the 17th century says, in the Key of the Afghans, The arrow needs an archer, and poetry a magician. He must ever hold in his mind the scales of metre, rejecting the long and the short. Truth is his mistress, aside a black steed, veiled in allegory. From beneath her lashes shoot a hundred unerring glances. The poet will decorate her fingers with multi-hued jewels, adorn her with the perfume and scent of saffron metaphor. Alliteration will ring like footbells, on her bosom will be the mystery of concealed rhyme. Together with the secrets of inner meaning, the concealing eyes, these make her body a perfection of mystery. Translated by T.C. Plowden What exactly was lost in the transition of the love theme from east to west? First of all, the knowledge, which can be imparted only by human association, of the wider significance of love and where it connects with other elements in life. The individual who merely equates love with divinity is a barbarian from the point of view of the person who has found the connection with the reason of life. Secondly, the intricacies, the depth within depth, contained in the works of art which were produced by the Sufi adepts. The barbarian takes what nutrition he can from what he sees or handles. The colour-blind man may see all colours in shades of white, grey and black. This may be adequate to his desires, but according to the Sufi, it is not adequate to his needs. The intricacy of much Eastern and other art is not merely a display of versatility or skill. It is an analogy of the infinite successions of meanings which can be transmitted by one and the same thing. Further, those who have glimpsed the Sufi experiences realize that the multiple meanings contained in such a work of art are there, so far as the human being is concerned, in order to lead him to a true perception of what the inner reality is. It is the perception of this inner reality which enables him to take himself forward to the greater evolution which is the destiny of man. Most people will see in a series of Chinese boxes, one inside the other, only an excellent artistic or craftsmanlike achievement. The Sufi, having found the key to eternal succession, will realize that this produce is an analogy 
not something to puzzle or delight the barbarian. So it is with the entire love theme for the Sufi. With the analogy of love and the literary use he makes of it, he can help to bridge the gap in understanding for others who are at an earlier stage of the path. Love is a common denominator for mankind. The Sufi, having penetrated its secrets to the tasting of the true reality which lies behind, returns to the world in order to convey something of the steps of the path. Those who remain intoxicated by the wayside are not his concern. Those who wish to go further must study him and his works. This podcast is copyright 2016, the Idris Shah Foundation.